Hi, and welcome back to Bots and Beyond. Another great episode, another great guest, as always, this uh, this week. This week, I'm joined by Max Iofi. Max and I, uh, we met actually at an event in New Orleans in maybe 2021. So we, we met at a conference and it was actually a, a workshop I was hosting around citizen developer. And we'll talk a little bit about some of that uh, later. But we've been connected on LinkedIn ever since. And as anyone will will know, if they are part of our LinkedIn community, that there is a really vibrant, continuous discussion about the world of intelligent automation that is available online. So if you're not already part of the great and good of our LinkedIn community, then uh, then please do take part um, because there is so much knowledge being shared uh, and you know, great insights from people like Max. Um, and you know the reason why we kind of re-collaborated on today's episode was actually as a result of a LinkedIn poll, and we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Um, I've done all the talking so far, and that's not usually what happens. So I want to intro Max. So Max, uh, hi, welcome to Bots and Beyond. Hey Wayne, th- thank you so much for having me here. Very excited, very happy to be. Fantastic. And obviously I'm very excited to have you, as will the audience be, uh, as we get into uh, in, into Max's mind and, uh, and talk through today's episode. Um, I know a little bit about you. We've caught up a number of times now, but I am very keen for the audience to learn more about you. So as is standard for our Bots and Beyond guest, really interested if you can do your intro, who you are, what you do, and why you do it. Thank you, Wayne. And uh, the last part is particularly the most interesting to me. Why are we doing it? Why why am I doing intelligent automation? So that's an awesome inclusion into the conversation. But to start who I am, I am um, director of Global Intelligent Automation Center of Excellence for Viesco Distribution. Viesco is a Fortune 200 company. our mission is to build, connect, power, and protect the world. So basically, we are a distributor. We buy from the suppliers, we sell to the customers, we provide the solutions. So it's not just selling the product, but also selling our expertise, our solutions, our knowledge, uh, and all that stuff. That's slightly different from intelligent automation world as far as banking and insurance companies. We are you know, very much deregulated industry, the industry that does not have a lot of standardization, and it makes it a lot more fun to drive intelligent automation program in that environment. Uh, We are also trying to provide an extra service to the customer, and our customer base is huge. It's um, 130,000 plus customers. We partner with 30,000 of suppliers. Our goal is to add something unique, add something to the equation where Customers and suppliers see us as a partner of choice. And in order to do that, we are trying to do the unique things. That's just the opposite to the intelligent automation mantra of let's take something standardized and automate it, right? So finding finding the niche for intelligent automation in that industry is what I do. And um, my center of excellence own everything from pipeline generation and culture changes to um, implementation of the automations, running the citizen developers program, scheduling uh, bots, supporting the bots, all but hardware that the animations run on belong to my center of excellence. We are a um, centralized environment. We're not a federated, we're a centralized model. And back to why we're doing it, why I do that, it's the joint satisfaction on being able to say, uh, look, somebody came to me with a problem and I was able to solve it. I've been around IT and business for quite a while, but uh, this role is probably the most direct way to influence the results. Somebody comes with a problem, you talk to them, you figure out a solution, they go back without that problem. Somebody comes and says, here's what my day looks like. We talk about the part that they dislike, we talk about the manual tedious work that they have to do, and all of a sudden that work is gone from their plate. It's a scalability, it's the ROI, but it's mostly that satisfaction of helping others and making the real tangible difference that I can come in and see the results is what drove me into that role. What a brilliant why. And uh, that's why we're kindred spirits, because I love a problem. Like I, uh, 
I, I usually intro myself as a I'm a problem solver. Um, so uh, we're de definitely kindred spirits there. I love a problem to solve. So um, great intro. Um, I think that gives loads of background into uh, into what you do, why you do it, etc. Um, I touched upon how we met, which is great. I touched upon LinkedIn. Um, the 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 post that really drove the conversation that led to us recording today uh, was around um, was around challenges to scaling actually, um, and it was a poll and there was four answers um, that basically said, look, you know, what are the biggest challenges to scaling? And the reason why the poll was out there is because I was I was running a webinar. Uh, and I was really interested in what the current temperature was in the market around what is inhibiting scale of intelligent automation. And the four options were, you know, budget, sponsorship, lack of pipeline or talent. Um, and you made some really insightful comments. I would love to get your thoughts on what you are thinking around around this particular uh, open topic. I posted on LinkedIn to the gist of saying, Look, I think that's a great poll. However, we're talking about symptoms and not the root causes. And uh, just like you said, problem solving is what attracts me there. And the first part of the problem solving is root cause analysis, right? Why do we have this problem? And as it goes down to the four um, answers, the budget, the sponsorship, the pipeline and talent. Well, yeah, you cannot scale when you don't have the pipeline. You cannot scale when you don't have the budget. You cannot scale when you don't have the sponsorship. But those are the symptoms of, in my mind, of something different. And uh, to maybe elaborate on each one of them a little bit more, when you think about the budget, the way at least I think about the budget is a very simplistic way. A budget is a function of two things. One is what is company able to spend on this type of a program, and that's more of a income statement and uh, generally the sort of size of the company uh, conversation. Nothing to do with the scalability, just the reality of how much money is out there to be spent. And then the other part is, am I as a center of excellence leader successful at getting my fair or more than my fair share of that available budget for my program, as there are tons of competing initiatives in any company, right? And that's my direct responsibility to figure out how to get that fair share. Does it come from the sponsorship? Absolutely. How do I get every executive in a company, or at least some executives of the company, to say, yeah, that's the program we support. Yeah, that's the program we care about. Well, that comes from the pipeline, right? Those executives naturally want to see what's there for me. What's for them are completed automations and the pipeline of opportunities that I can complete. How do I get to that pipeline? Again, it's my in my job description as a leader of the center of excellence to figure out a way to deliver the pipeline and to build that pipeline. So after I deliver the first wave, I have the second wave of projects. To me, the healthy situation is when I have a lot more projects that I'm working on and I know how to get a lot more projects than the projects I already know about, right? And that comes from the trifesta of budget sponsorship pipeline and the talent is a part of it as well. Uh, the talent is not just the programmers and developers, but the talent is also folks who can come and say, hey, that's an opportunity. Let's figure it out. So I think if the program is successful, if the program is ready to be scaled, it should not be talking about lack of pipeline. It cannot have the lack of opportunities, excitement and sponsorship. And frankly, having those contributors will get you the budget. Uh, talent, I I would keep it slightly separate. We're all we all know what kind of world we're living in as far as the war on talent. It's definitely a huge challenge. But again, how do I build that talent within my organization? How do I keep the talent that I already have? That's on me. That's on me as a successful driver for the center of excellence. Loads of great points within there. Um, you you reference the kind of the trifecta. Um, so I guess. The view really is, and if we think about the trifecta around budget, sponsorship and pipeline, what you're basically saying is it's not one or the other that is likely to be the problem. Really, you you kind of need all three, right? There is no reason how and why you can't have 
all, uh, all, all three uh, involved. You did reference pipeline quite a lot, though, in the conversation there. I'm, I'm intrigued to see whether or not there is any words of wisdom and things that you are doing to generate pipeline maybe more successfully than others. And um, again, some of the stuff that you mentioned earlier on, which was quite insightful around, you know, we don't necessarily look, we don't have lots of standardized ways of working. Therefore, everything, every problem we're solving does feel quite unique. That usually is not a good sign when when you go into an organization who wants to use RPA. So I'm really intrigued in uh, what are you doing around pipeline management? And is there anything specific that you're doing that it's keeping your pipeline healthy? Um, yeah, absolutely. The pipeline is definitely the foundation for the successful center of excellence. You cannot have the conversation about the sponsorship, the conversation about the budget, if you don't have a pipeline, if you don't have a story, here's what I did. And by the way, here's what I can do. The challenge, especially with a centralized governance model, and I think the centralized governance model works and I like it. However, the challenge is that me as a driver of the center of excellence, I often say that I am a jack of all chicks, but I'm a master of none. I'm talking with folks from finance, accounting, HR, sales, operations, supply chain, talking about their automations. Well, I'm not an expert in any one of those particular areas. I've been around businesses for quite a while. I sort of kind of understand how things work, but that's where my level of expertise lies. So I'm trying to be very humble and very realistic that my ability to bring the pipeline, my ability to say, this would be an awesome project to do, oh, and this would be a great project to do, and then try to sell it is going to be limited by the fact that I'm not an expert. So I look at the pipeline from three different aspects. One is the top-down part generation. How do I reach out to the executives? How do I reach out to folks who actually own the functional areas and say, how can I help you? What can I do to solve your problems? Listen to them and try to meet their expectations and focus on the projects that they do. This is the top-down approach, right? I am not, I would not be able to survive with just that. To me, frankly, the biggest contributor is bottom-up, where I build the teams, an army of citizen developers. And what I do with citizen developers, first and foremost, I train them on pipeline uh, identification. I train them on pipeline opportunity um, creation, I would say. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, look, guys, when you see chance, you've been trained how to identify RPA, hopefully know how to build a bot, maybe not very comfortable building the bot. Most of my citizen developers are not programmers, but if you see an opportunity, bring it to the surface, and we will figure out the best way to do it. And uh, the citizen developers are typically the folks on the ground. They're typically the folks doing the actual work. So the pipeline from the executives could be inspirational in nature. Wouldn't it be great to solve this problem? But they may not be necessarily the folks who are pushing the buttons and doing the keystrokes. So they may not know all the details that are so important to identify successful RPA opportunity. When you go bottom up and you go to citizen developers, they're the ones pushing the buttons. They say, yeah, this is a real issue that I'm facing. This is where my time goes. I'm spending way more time on this problem than it's worse. I think it's automatable. I know that it's repetitive. I know that it's standardized. I know that there is no decision making. It's your classic RPA problem. They bring me the pipeline and they are my functional experts. So when I talk to executives and say, hey, I want to try to do this. I am, for one thing, I'm not necessarily talking to them directly. I let citizen developers to do a lot of talking. Uh, for another, I'm staying relevant to the process. And again, being um, a global center of excellence, I may not know reality on the ground in different countries. I don't know reality on the ground in different departments, but my citizen developers do. And this is that bottom-up approach that gives me the pipeline. And the third aspect of it, and uh, that's something that I'm trying to do a little more of, is uh, partnering up with process improvement folks. Uh, our company uses lean methodology to sort of do enter it not from the top, not from the bottom, but from the 
sidelines where if you're doing the process re-engineering, if the company is talking about having a Kaizen to look at whatever process and identify what should the future process look like, what's what's the best way of doing the same thing. I am trying to be a part of those discussions as much as I can. And again, say when we design in the new processes, can we design it to be automation friendly? So it's the top down, it's uh, bottom up, it's uh, entering it from the middle. Doing all that gives me the pipeline. And to your point, the pipeline generates the excitement, generates the sponsorship, sponsorship and excitement generate the budget. So they all go together. But I think the pipeline is really the primary driver of that. And um, as you uh, picked up on, we're not a very highly standardized process type of business. We are trying to deliver unique solutions. So a lot of our automation opportunities are not huge. It may not be bringing hundreds of thousands of hours per automation. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to focus on medium to smaller size opportunities. And to do that, we have to have a fairly lean center of excellence, fairly lean expense structure. And um, the other thing I would mention is um, the way we report the ROI, the way we talk about our success stories has to be attuned to the audience that we're talking to. Right. When we talk to the citizen developers, when we talk about the processes that we do, for one thing, we have to be realistic. Anybody can catch us overstating our results. For another thing, we have to pick the language that um, executives will understand, particularly for the budget conversation. If I say that I saved that many hours, I got to be very careful translating hours to FTEs. Yeah, we all know that if you divide it by the number of hours in a year, it's a very easy translation, but is it real? If you have 2,000 people doing some kind of a work and you save 10 minutes to each one of them, would that be given you an opportunity to repurpose or reduce the headcount? In numbers, yeah, absolutely. But is it real? Will you be able to pinpoint those positions? Or do you talk about extra productivity created and do you explain how those hours can convert into something bigger and better? Tuning the messaging to the audience is super important. And I think that also helps to drive the pipeline as you are staying real and realistic. People appreciate that and people come to you. Excellent. I love the three pronged approach there. And uh, of course, people always talk about what's the right thing to do, top down, bottom up. Usually they're thinking about um strategy or direction you're saying look why aren't you doing both uh, so i really i really like that um we we did touch upon and you referenced this as part of your pipeline creation citizen developer and obviously we did speak about about this at the event and i know we're very aligned on on what they are and also what they aren't um but i am very keen to understand and i think i i, I already know the answer but i would love to to get your view on this but citizen developers you know are they a help or a hindrance to scaling and as i say i would i think i know the answer but i would really be appreciate your your view on on that right i and, and again just to i know you and i on the same page but for the benefit of the audience when we talk about citizen developers we're not talking about folks with it background we're not talking about folks uh maybe an executive deciding to play with that we're talking about normal day-to-day -day workers who expressed some interest and went through training and now they are ready or able to do a couple of things one is they should be a big part of my training at least is to train citizen developers how to identify the opportunity how to look at the day-to-day -day activities that they do and identify those nuggets that are scalable that are repetitive, that are uh, easy decision-making, no decisions, uh, no judgment calls, or simple decisions that could be converted to an if statement as opposite to using AIML to say, hey, this is an easy opportunity. They can also clarify if that opportunity is easy or difficult. But they understand that the judgment calls are 
more difficult. They understand that unstructured documents bring more complexity than structured documents. When you talk about that, and as you talk about process variations, as you talk about all those variables that um, impact the uh, complexity and suitability, your citizen developers are really your ambassadors into the business. They're embedded into the business. They're doing the day-to-day -day work. They know exactly what's happening, right? And they know exactly what to look for for the opportunities to automate. If you have that combination, that gives you the pipeline of opportunities that I would never be able to find. A significant portion of opportunities that come my way from citizen developers, I consider myself fairly smart and fairly business savvy from being around companies and businesses for several decades. Well, I should know how things work. I should understand it. But when they bring in the process and you say, well, I have no clue that there is this step in accounting. I had no clue that our warehouses in certain part of the world have mandatory um, devices that measure humidity and temperature. Well, I'm from the United States. We don't really have a big concern about it. Well, if you're in other parts of the world, that could be a big factor. So all of a the sudden, there is an opportunity to automate reading off from those devices and taking some actions or at least raising the alarm if the parameters get outside of the um, range. How would I know about it if I didn't have the citizen developers? So I don't think citizen developers are hindering the scaling. I think it's quite the opposite. I think the citizen developers are the way to scale. They are the ambassadors into the business. They know exactly the processes. They understand exactly what can be done. Now, this said, a citizen developer sitting in the process typically sit in the one step of that process. And that's the distinction between the task automation and the process automation. And me as a center of excellence and my resources can come to a citizen developer and say, I get your problem. Yeah, we we want to empower you to automate it, or we want to collaborate with you to automate it, depending on the complexity and the skill set and frankly the amount of time that citizen developer can uh, allocate and the amount of interest that they have to allocate that time. But can we look a little bit to the left and to the right? Can we scale that task automation to a process automation scale? Can we go as wide as we can and look at the process end to end and see what can what else can be done, right? A citizen developer selfishly, and I would be doing this exact same thing, is focused on what can I do to make my day go better? Well, when I am as a global center of excellence driver, look at the process, I'm thinking what can I do to make the same thing better for the entire company? The answer could be slightly different, and that's where our expertise, our understanding, our partnership with Lean and uh, process improvement teams come into play where sometimes we say, yeah, let's, let's automate it. In other cases, we might say, yeah, let's automate it to stop the bleeding, but also let's try to understand the process a little bit better and figure out what we can do to change the process uh, in a more significant way. In other cases, we might say, you know what, based on what we understand, Here's our recommendation. We're going to automate a much bigger process. We're going to automate it end to end, and we're going to take it as a slightly different process. Is everybody okay with that? And then it becomes a sales job to make sure that everybody is interested and we can sell that um, process and that project. With, and that's how I would see the citizen developers to be really the drivers of scalability. There's only so much you can see from your executive chair into the processes, into the steps that are happening in the organization. And when you have those ambassadors and those ambassadors know what they're doing, they're trained, they're educated, that's where the scalability comes uh, comes in play. And a lot thing I want to do, and it sort of ties back to that survey, when the opportunity come, comes in, I firmly believe that a small automation in production is much bigger and better than a huge automation in development. So what we try to do, we try to break it, break any automation into a very small manageable chunks. And what we were able to do, and this is back to the scaling, uh, 
take many small bots built by different citizen developers who may or may not even know each other and connect them into a much bigger process automation. Maybe one bot focuses on downloading the data and massaging the data a little bit, and that was built by citizen developer A. Citizen developer B takes that data and uh, eventually keys it into the ERP system. Well, there is a bot that keys it into the ERP system. That's developed by a different citizen developer. What if I connect the two? So now I have one bot to download and massage the data. I have maybe a human in the loop to make some decisions. And then I have another bot to key the data into the ERP. We have those daisy chains of bots. There, in some cases, I have 10 bots passing the data to each other. And out of those 10 bots, eight were developed by citizen developers. Two, more complex, more sensitive, more risky, if you will, from the uh, data that it touches standpoint or the system that it touches standpoint were developed by Center of Excellence Resources, but they're all connected. And this daisy chain of 10 bots work in unison to automate a process that has much more ROI than those individual bots that were identified and built by citizen developers. So the citizen developers to me is my ticket to scale. And again, I'm in decentralized, deregulated industry where we're trying to deliver a lot of flexibility and a lot of unique solutions. Again, citizen developers make it much easier to scale with minimum overhead. A lot of the bots done by citizen developers bring maybe a thousand hours a year. If I had to go through full SDLC cycle and have the huge center of excellence and my output would be uh, a thousand hours a year, I will probably not be able to scale. I will not get the budget. I will not get the sponsorship. So in my case, at least, citizen developers is the most effective and quickest way to scale. Maybe a controversial question, and this is the last one because then we, we will need to wrap up the episode, I guess. But if you had unlimited budget, would you even be talking about citizen developers? Saving the, saving the best to the end. No, that's that's a great question. And um, I think it widely depends on the industry and on the program and on the situation. My answer would be yes. And I am all about connecting intelligent automation to cultural change that needs to happen so there is an acceptance and utilization of the automations. So there is excitement about it. So the employee doesn't come back saying, oh, there is somebody from corporate who wants to automate my job. Heck no, I'm not going to be collaborative with them. I'm not interested. I want to protect my job. I want to protect my income. I want to protect my um, role in the company. When you build a robust organization of citizen developers. A citizen developers come to you and says, I want to automate this. I do this task, I hate this task, I want to automate this task. They come to you and they're your ally. There is no more concern about job security. There is no more concern about what am I gonna do? There is no more concern about somebody from the corporate trying to go behind my back and do something bad. It's cultural change that comes from our program of citizen developers, where citizen developers comes in and says, hey, can we do it? Quite honestly, significant portion of my pipeline today comes from the emails from either citizen developers or folks who worked with citizen developers simply saying, hey, I found this opportunity, can we do it? I don't have to hunt for it. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to be overly concerned that if I scale and bring another developer, will I have enough work to pay their time and their salary, right? Uh, the citizen developers are not just cheap labor, and I don't consider them that a single bit. I'm looking at the citizen developers as ambassadors into the business, as uh, folks who can be that intelligence on the ground to tell me what needs to be automated, but they're also ambassadors of change and embracement of digital technology. This goes a little bit better than just uh, RPA or pick your technology of choice. This is the general cultural shift where an employee can look at their day of the day in the office and say, hey, these are the things that I do not like doing. These are not adding value. This is not what I'm hired to do. And in the current market where employees can easily pick where they're hired and what they want to do, 
that becomes even more important when we say to somebody, look, we are hiring you to be financial analyst. And by the way, you will not have to run the reports. We have robots that run the reports and prepare the reports for you. We need you to unleash your creativity. We need you to figure out the best way to solve the problem and let the robots take care of report download, which might have taken somebody else two hours every morning to download and connect the reports. And all of a the sudden, there is this automation that is built that does it and connects the reports and does all the magic. If we can do that, we are going to empower the citizen developers. We're going to empower the organization. We're going to scale. So I think limited or unlimited budget, if anything, I would put significant portion of my unlimited budget toward training more of the citizen developers and training more employees to drive the change. And, you know, programmers are big part of the expense, but if they're working on the opportunities that are very high quality opportunities, and they are opportunities that are going to get 110% utilization, that's the smart investment. And I do have a lot of instances, as I said it, I just uh, realized that we have a lot of instances where a citizen developer comes to us saying, hey, I want to build this bot, and it's going to save me maybe two hours a day, and I, we are a team of 10 people, so it's going to be uh, 10 times the two hours a day. Let's do it. Let's build the bot. We build the bot. We look at the utilization, and we see that there is a lot more happening. That bot is working a lot more hours than we expected. We go back to the citizen developer and say what happened, and they said, yeah, we used the bot for a couple of months. We loved it so much that we changed our processes. We brought in a little bit more standardization, so now our bots are doing a lot more than they used to. We thought it wasn't possible, but when we saw the bot, when we saw the benefits, when we saw the conveniences, we were interested in changing our business and standardizing it. So now we have this higher utilization, go update your numbers. And I love that for two reasons. One is it impacts my productivity numbers and uh, ROI, but most importantly, this is the, the change that I would never be able to drive without having the citizen developers. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, Max, we want you to change your process. We want to change the way you do the business so we can automate it a little bit better. That would be hell no from two standpoints. And one is I don't want anybody to automate my business without me being in the driver's seat. Two, why should I change my process? Especially when whoever is asking about me to change the process doesn't understand the intricacies of my job. Well, the citizen developers routes allows us to do that. And as they allow us to do it, we scale more. And as we scale more, it brings the appetite to scale even more. So that's that self-feeding loop that we are trying to get ourselves into where limited or unlimited budget, we are going to get much, much better results in my mind by partnering with business through the citizen developers program or whatever you want to call it, and do that. Um, so that's your answer. I have so many questions, but no time. <laughs> <laughs> that's always a sign of a good episode when you have provided so much insight and experience that uh, I just want it, I just want it to continue. Maybe we need to do a part two. Um, I love your outlook on citizen developers and everything else, actually. So. Uh, there is definitely more conversation to be had here. Um, Max, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your time and your insights. And I'm absolutely positive that the audience will have uh, absolutely loved hearing your thoughts uh, and no doubt will be in touch as a result of picking your brain a little bit more. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, audience, for listening. Uh, this has been Bots and Beyond, and we will speak to you again soon. Mm -hmm.